guest today is Andrew Bolas. Andrew has 15 years of marketing leadership experience. Most recently, he was a full-time CMO at a Series B tech startup. Currently, he's a marketing consultant who helps drive growth for startups. He said that he is also a big fan of live comedy, which I am too. So I'm excited to talk to him about this. So in today's episode, Andrew is going to talk about the advantages of using email outreach, the most common problems with outreach emails, and how to write a great email subject line, and everything related to email outreach. Let's jump right in. Okay, Andrew, I'm excited to have you on the podcast today. I have so many questions for you. So thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, I wanted to start with, in your bio, you said you're a big fan of live comedy. So do you mean like actually you go out to comedy clubs? Because I'm a big fan too. So I'm just curious, like, are there clubs near you that you you go to watch comedy? Uh, yeah, definitely. So I think my first introduction to comedy was, was stand-up comedy, like seeing it on on TV back in the day, because this was even before Netflix. Um, and I think once I started going out to live comedy shows, I realized it was a much more fun experience. Um, so since then, uh, I'm a fan of stand-up, I'm a fan of improv comedy, and then once in a while, I'll also see sketch comedy teams. Oh, that's cool, because I used to live near the Irvine Improv in California. It's pretty well known. Yeah, I have a, a favorite, Brian Regan. Have you heard of him? Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with Brian, yeah. Do you have a favorite comedian? Not a not necessarily like a favorite comedian. I think it depends on my mood. So uh, so yeah. that like like I range between maybe some dark comedy once in a while to more you know uh, socially friendly comedy and and, and sort of everything in between. Uh, I do yeah. think it's nice that there's different unique styles yeah. and, and even different kind of ways of, of of being funny. Like I think that's what makes it interesting. What I love about comedy because I've 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 seen Brian Regan. I've seen a couple other people, but. The way that they structure jokes and a lot of it can carry over into marketing, like even just being creative with what, you know, a lot of it's like observational comedy, like in copywriting, I use a lot of that with not necessarily comedy, but just really observing how people act, how they make decisions, like all of that. When you put a magnifying glass on it and turn it into a comedy sketch, it's funny, but it's all, you know, a lot of these comedians just do that. Like Jerry Seinfeld's known for that, just observational comedy. It's not really funny until you really look at it. So I just find it interesting. It's it's something that you're into. But um, but yeah, so to get into today's subject about we're gonna talk about email outreach. You and I talked about this earlier about how a lot of companies that don't have a marketing budget really kind of struggle a bit. And so what you had said to me was that for one, cold outreach isn't about selling anything. So why don't we start with that? So what did what did you mean by that? So the goal of cold outreach, and, and that's like, I think good cold outreach is to get a reply. So there's different ways to do that. But the idea is it's a way to start conversations. Um, and it's usually more cost effective if you do it properly. So it's not like, because I think people think of cold outreach as a sales pitch. So you're saying that it's absolutely not that. It's usually not a sales pitch unless you already have enough context where you can make it a relevant sales pitch, right? So like um, in most cases, you're not going to have a lot of context. And specifically, or if you're going after the C-suite, they get so many uh, sales pitches in their email that if if you're going to start off pitching right away, unless like they already know your product or have a very strong positive impression of what your product does, they're just generally going to you know mark you as spam or or, or block you or just right. won't even open it basically. Yeah, and that I hear that from a lot of companies because um, I do write email sequences, and a lot of people have said to me, "Well, you know, it's getting harder and harder to reach somebody through email because." Like you said, you know, especially when you have like a preview snippet, like, do you have that on your email where you can see, like you have the subject and then you also have like the first line of the email. So you kind of have an idea, you know, what it's about. And if that's not resonating, it's like, you don't even have to open it to know you're just going to delete it. Right. So you also said that what works well is a combination of cold branding and social selling. Did I get that right? Sure. So so it's a combination of like, like social selling and your online presence. So even if someone gets a great outreach email, I mean, there's kind of like a couple of steps. One is it's a good enough subject line and 
previous snippet that they even open it. Uh, most cold emails never get opened and there's different reasons for that, but that's generally the biggest problem. Once they open it, even if they like what you're saying and are curious to reply, they often will either Google your name or Google your company name to just understand what you're even about sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and either your LinkedIn will come up or in the case of the company name, the website will often come up. So those are two things too that you can generally control that if you fix will improve a lot of the response rate to your cold uh, emails. It sounds like this is even something that can also relate to like DMs on LinkedIn, right? Like if somebody sends you a pitch and I don't even know, I send DMs to people I know to ask like just questions that are like I asked a couple of people the other day, you know, do you know of some good podcast guests? And I know these people and I'm not asking, I'm not selling anything, but I know they're not checking their DMs. They probably get so many. So do you think it's the same thing with that? Like they'll, they're going to check your profile and your company profile? Yeah, they, they definitely will. And I, and I think in your case, like they're going to be seeing, you know, like your, your own presence on LinkedIn, who she's had on as guests before what kind of topics they're discussing. And if they get the sense that, hey, this is a high quality show or podcast, they're obviously going to be a lot more receptive to responding. Mm -hmm. uh, but but, the, but yeah, I think the way you even mentioned it, I think the best outreach or even like a LinkedIn DM is more like of a friendly conversation starter. It's not necessarily to go in for the, the sell right away. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed though is, um, well, there's two things with DMs on on LinkedIn and actually emails too is with all the AI going on. They're starting to, I can just tell when somebody's used AI to, to DM me because it's, it's obvious. It's like just sounds so vague and, and it's annoying because I know they're not even, you know, making the smallest amount of effort to personalize it. I mean, have you noticed that with DMs? Yeah, I definitely noticed that. So I get DMs now that says, uh, love your work at self-employed. Because <laughs> I do consulting and that's the company name I have. So it's clear that, yeah, they're usually doing mass uh, DMs and they're just, you know, grabbing one or two things that th they think is like right personalization. Yeah. Um, and probably like annoying a lot of people and getting blocked and stuff. That is funny because there's a there's a platform. I wouldn't say which one, but it, it's supposed to help you kind of break into getting your cold outreach out there. And they have these templates and every one of them is the same. Like you just plug in, like what you said, you know, you plug in the person's title and the rest of it is just vague and kind of general. And I, people are onto that kind of thing. I, so the same thing with email. So would you say that's the biggest problem with outreach emails is, is just the, the cold pitching or what would you say are some of the problems? So, so I think that the, the top problem with cold emails is even getting into the person's inbox in the first place. So most cold emails uh, end up in junk or spam or end up in uh, the promotions tab. If you're using uh, G Suite or Gmail, they never end up in the person's inbox, so they never see it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of reasons to that. Some of them are technical reasons, like if you just have been sending a lot of cold emails and, and, and annoying people, you're mailer reputation, you know, goes down and, and there's ways to fix that. I don't want to get into the technical kind of site too much because a lot of tools will help you do that. So a lot of cold outreach email tools, as we start using them, will help you kind of set up the technical side. The biggest thing is, is you know, assuming you're even ending up in the inbox is a subject line, right? So almost think of like, what's a friendly subject line you'd get from someone you already know versus a cold person. So like one of the examples I like is like, you know, a company I was working at posted a marketing job description and the subject line is Andrew comma hiring question mark. So that sounds like something like a recruiter that I already know potentially would, would send, for example. What do you think about, because this is, I actually recently did a whole webinar on, on emails. And one of the things that I had seen that seems to work, and I know it works with me, is if you put the subject line in lowercase, because it's more like you've dashed this off kind of to a friend. And because if you use subject, is it type, title case when every letter is capitalized, it says newsletter, it kind of screams newsletter. Do you agree with that? Like just to have lowercase? Yeah, lowercase works because um, it looks like something, again, like someone you already know would send you. Whereas like if you're using title case, it looks like almost like a marketing or a, a promotional email of some sort. Yeah, exactly. What if, What's your take on emoticons? Because I, 
is it emoticons? Yeah, that's what um, I've seen kind of pros and cons because I get a lot of, it's usually in the promotional emails because I do use Gmail, but I've heard that that's a way to get yourself right into spam. So I think they work for like marketing emails. Like if you actually have someone subscribed and you're sending them a newsletter and emoticon is, is kind of a nice touch and they already know you. I think for cold email, it makes it clear that this is like a cold email. Cause like if I'm emailing a colleague, I'm not going to like sit there and like select the emoticon in my subject line, right? Like, it's so like that right away gives it off. So even if you end up in their inbox, they're likely not going to read it. I didn't even think of that. That's true. Yeah. I never send, I would never send a friend something with a smiley face in the subject line, maybe in the email itself, but not in the subject yeah. line. I, I don't know. Yeah. I wouldn't even think about doing that. What other tips about creating a great like outreach email subject line? Is there anything else people can do to get attention and get it, their email open? Yes. I I mean, there's three things I, I think short, relevant, and personalized. Um, so short, like ideally it's uh, two, three, four words, you know, most uh, relevant, it, there should have been a trigger. Like the one I mentioned is like, if a company's hiring and you're reaching out to the hiring manager, that's a good trigger. Um, and ideally you want to point that out in the, in the email and then personalize if you can use their first name or maybe their industry or something that's personal to them that also helps. Yeah. I do notice lately the people who are successful, like I had someone recently it was a little while ago, but on a, on a DM that he has a video company and he, he created a video for me with my logo on it, with the header that had my company name. I mean, he went all out on this thing and I was, you know, I responded because I was really impressed. No one had done that. But the problem was I, I just didn't have need for what he was selling. So even though it could be, you know, something relevant or something that was, you know, really well written. We went back and forth a couple of times on DMs, but I said, I just don't need this right now. A friend of mine I was talking to and telling the story and he said, well, the, the thing is though, that you'll remember him, and maybe recommend him, you know, to someone who does need his services. But that was probably one of the best forms of outreach because it was cold. I had never spoken to this person, but he had done his research. I mean, you think it takes that much research to really get somebody's attention? You think that's necessary in the way today's market is? I, I think it does, but you also have to think about it long term, right? So even if you're not ready to buy from the person, you are going to likely appreciate the effort. At a minimum, you'll likely accept their connection request. And let's say they post on LinkedIn once or twice a week. Well, now you're going to be seeing those posts, right? So they, they will stay top of mind for you for when you are ready to buy, which which often, you know, when you look at like your TAM, uh, most of your TAM isn't ready to buy, but it's nice to, you know, still be top of mind for them. And that's what you hear all the time is something, a huge percentage of people are just not, they're not ready to buy. And so you have to, it's like a constant, you know, it's, it's just constantly being out there and being consistent and I mean, I've been on LinkedIn consistently for two years and I'm just now starting to burn out a little bit just because every single day and there's different tactics too that you can use to kind of keep in front of the people that you most want to attract, you know, so I'm trying to do more of that. But is there anything about structuring the outreach email? So you said to keep the subject line short. What about the email itself? Because there's a lot of debate about short, long emails. I prefer shorter emails because often two people will be opening it on their phone. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're going after executives, which is who I'm um, typically targeting, they just don't have that much time, right? So anything longer than I would say, you know, three sentences, I, I found that it just doesn't perform as well. The only exception is if, if they already know you or have a positive impression of your brand, which in which case everything will perform well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so I think just if it's, if it's cold, keeping it short helps. Um, and I like to think of it as a kind of an opener, middle, and uh, and um, end of the email structure. What's a good way to open up an email? Like definitely not, I hope this email finds you well, right? Because it's yeah. like the worst. <laughs> but what, what do you usually recommend, you know, to, to open up an email with? So I, I, I like first name, comma, saw that you're doing X or notice that your company is X, like 
because again, this is Bill's relevant and it's personalized. Um, so it, 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 it mentions the, the reason for the email in the first place, which I think is helpful. Mm -hmm. So maybe doing a little research on, um, you know, what the company has been doing and if they've had some new acquisitions or what about if they're a person? Cause one of the things I was using sales navigator for a while, but it's just as a single entrepreneur, I don't really, I wasn't using it enough. So I quit it. But one of the things, the options on it enabled you to search for people who are new to, I think it's started in the position like 90 within 90 days or something. Why is that relevant? Yeah. So sales navigator is great for this and you could set up uh, who you're targeting and get alerts. It, it's relevant because like, for example, like a head of marketing or a head of sales that's coming in, they often find that they make a lot of purchases uh, in that first 90 days where they come in, they see that something is is broken and they need like a, you know, to replace the tool uh, or they're just used to a certain tool that that company doesn't have. And they um, like using it at their last company and they now want to use it at their new company. Oh, okay. That makes sense because I don't work in that environment. You know, I'm not really, I always wondered because it's like, well, I would think people would be kind of crazy the first, you know, three months of working at a place, but that's also when they're making changes, right? Exactly. And, and that's why, like, that's one of the triggers, even in LinkedIn Sales Navigator, is when someone like changes jobs, like, which is a good one to use because if they go to the new company, you know, and, and they were using the tool at the older company, they'll, they're likely going to want it at the new company. Right. So it's something that they, they like. It's like a favorite. It's, it's like on a negative side is if you're the one who does all the hiring and you go in and you get rid of everybody in your department. That's why people kind of dread it if there's somebody new taking over, right? Because they don't know if they're going to be sticking around, which unfortunately is a lot of that going on right now with uh, tech companies. So yeah. But what about, so you get throughout the, the email. So you're doing, um, you're getting to the point and then your call to action at the end what do you suggest in a cold outreach? Before I get to the call to action, so that the middle part is ideally like one line that says what it is that you do and, and some kind of proof or results. So in the case of a recruiter, like, you know, I help five companies in the last month hire, you know, 10 marketing managers. So that's good because that tells me what it is that you do. And, and then usually then the, the call to action or, or, or the close is, is some kind of a question to get a casual rep reply. So I typically don't like including links. I don't like linking to a resource or whatever, because even that is kind of an investment they have to click through. I, I just want to get a reply from them. So it could be something like, you know, if we could help you place a candidate, would that be useful for you? Question mark. One of the things I had always been told, but it's a little bit different because now it's like if, if you're targeting people all over the world, I was going to say that you, you say, hey, you know, there's three times that I can meet with you, but I was going to say like, so you would put like, Hey, how about Tuesday or Thursday or Friday at this time? You know, I can, I can meet, but if you haven't even established that trust yet and they don't really know you, that seems like that would be too forward. Exactly. Like if they're not even willing to send you like a casual one word reply, like saying yes or no, or, or maybe they're not going to book a meeting with you. Um, and if they are ready to book a meeting, a lot of them will mention them in a reply anyway. Um, the, the other advantage of trying to get a reply from them is that it ensures all your future emails end up in their inbox because now you become like one of their contacts. That's a good point. Yeah. And so you're out of their spam and into, yeah, because that could be hard. Because I know for some reason my emails, and I've never spammed anybody, but I a lot of times my emails will end up in, in the junk folders. And I don't understand why that is, but... <laughs> But I always tell people you have to check and make sure that, you know, it's because I'll reach out to somebody on LinkedIn if I haven't heard from them. If this is somebody I know and say, hey, I've been, you know, we've been going back and forth. And I don't know where my emails are ending up, but they're somehow lost. Is there anything else? So what if what if we send out a cold outreach email and you get no response? Should you follow up? Yeah, you should definitely follow up in the best outreach motions are typically like a sequence. So it's usually multiple emails and and, and the emails discuss different things. Um, you should definitely, you know, have other emails and, and you should also try to engage them on other channels like like LinkedIn, for example. So how do you kind of juggle that? You know, you don't want to be annoying, but yet, like for me, I know a lot of people do this, it's not just me, but I use an email tracker just because I want to know if people are opening it because it it's helped me a lot of times with a, 
a new client where I just want to make sure they received my email. So I can see they opened it. I won't usually follow up. What do you think about email trackers? Is that something you think is is helpful? Yeah, I think it's helpful to know how many people are opening your emails and and even in your follow-up that tells you how to follow up. So a common thing is if you see someone opening, you know, the first, second emails, but they're never replying. At that point, a lot of people will then try to find that person's phone number, for example, and 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 cold call them, knowing that you know the person likely won't answer, but they can at least leave a voicemail or something, which which is another touch point. Mm-hmm. How would what would you say on that call? I always feel like a stalker or something. Like no one answer, no one answers the phone anyway. But how would you? What would you yeah. say? So, so again, a lot of, you know, cold calling is, is, it's kind of its own subject, but, but in many ways, the whole point of the voicemail is to build a stronger impression. So you, you, you say your name, you say, Hey, so and so from this company, you can almost repeat what you would send in the first email, but now it's a voice note and now they're hearing your voice. So, so it's just a lot more personal. Again, usually you're not going to get a, like someone calling you back. Mm-hmm. But it leaves a stronger impression, you know, than just an email or something, because now they at least heard your voice. What do you, what do you think about videos? Because I know there's a lot of people talk about, especially on LinkedIn, you know, sending a short video. I mean, I like the idea of it. I just I get videos sometimes, and I rarely open them. I don't know. I just feel like if I don't know you, I mean, do you do you think? Because I've heard two schools thought one is you send it immediately, like as a cold outreach, and the other is you wait until you're a couple of emails into it or something before you do that. Yeah, I think with video, I mean, it depends on, on your resources, but I think it's probably smarter to at least wait until they're opening some emails. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing with video too is it will get watched if, if it actually adds value. So if I'm, let's say, a website agency and I'm going to go through your homepage and just point out a couple of things that fix that, that could improve your conversion rate, even if you're not ready to buy, like you're going to watch that video. Uh, if, if, if it's presented that way that, Hey, just went through your site, saw this one thing that you could fix that could likely, you know, improve your conversion rate. Um, I'm a lot more likely to watch that even if I'm not sort of ready to buy or shopping. Yeah. The thing with that, cause I've done that a couple of times, but you have to be careful too, that they're not insulted, but you're trying to fix something like it. it it's kind of walking that fine line. Um, but I, I think it would be hard to resist like what you said. If you say, hey, you can increase conversions with this one thing, who's not going to want to know? At least let me just see what it is. Yeah, I, I used to spend, there was one cold email. I talk about this on LinkedIn. I've talked about it a couple of times that landed me at probably the biggest client I had this a couple of years ago. I researched it really thoroughly, this company. It was a product that we used here in the house. And I could see that their messaging was incongruent with like their, their packaging. They had all kinds of fun wording and it was just, it was a fun kind of vibe. Yeah. On their website and it was just boring. And so I did some searching. I got, you know, the people included, it took me a day or two to put this email together and it was pretty funny too. So I added a lot of humor, uh, but I really let them know. You could tell I really knew what I was talking about and I researched it and the president actually got back to me and I did have a meeting and I did do a little bit of work with them, but they were an enterprise company. It was too big and really for everything was taking six months to get a response. And I was like, okay. So we it just kind of faded out. It wasn't any like, you know, major parting of ways, but, but that, that showed me just digging in and doing that kind of research really could make a difference. What, where can people find you and, and how can they reach out to you? Sure. So I'm very active on LinkedIn, so they can uh, look me up on LinkedIn and, and connect with me. I post on there uh, regularly. Yeah, I noticed that you have a pretty big following too. So yeah, I'm really happy you took the time to get on here. So, Well, thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate your time today.